Hey guys, how are you? Hey. Hi. I don't. I don't want to interrupt. It seems like oh, a very. It's fine. We 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 had to be constantly interrupting on set, so this is. <laughs> we're, we're talking, so you need to interrupt us. Keep going for family. I'm not family. No. Your cargo. I'm wondering, Pedro, if you can speak a little bit to like, what's his kind of worldview coming into this after Outbreak Day? The opening of the game is a great opportunity for us to start um, this show and experience Outbreak Day kind of, I guess, creatively in, 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 in real time, or at least to have a visceral sense of what Outbreak Day is. And then um, it's a day that shapes this character that kind of calcifies a loss and a heartbreak that can only be chipped away at by Bella's character, Ellie. Mm -hmm. And um, being forced onto a journey with a mirror of yourself, you know, in the shape of a teenage girl. It seems to me like he is almost caring for her or feeling protective of her before he even wants to. It, it seems to kick in pretty early. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? And do you think that she's aware of that? I don't know if Ellie's aware of it. I know that I, I, I like what you say in that something that he isn't even necessarily conscious of, the primal aspect of him is a caretaker, whether he wants to be that or not. It, mm -hmm. It's his reluctance that, that kind of um, makes it so interesting. And yet he can't help but um uh you know develop a, a, a protective feelings for her and overwhelmingly so it's the biggest threat actually to his survival is mm -hmm. to feel uh uh as deeply as he feels for for ellie i think That's... there is she knows that there's something up with you for sure like there's some sort of history that yeah like the shadow of loss or, yeah. that is directly related to maybe you know, being a parent of some kind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The ghost of, of, of Sarah, mm -hmm. beautifully played by Nico Parker at the start. So good. If she so much as twitches. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> Ellie was born after Outbreak Day. So like her sense of the world is completely different from Joel's. Talk to us a little bit about like what she's afraid of, what she thinks is cool, like how she sees the world when we come into this. This is a really nice question. Um, her biggest fear is ending up alone. Um, and that's very prevalent right from the beginning. Um, and I know that was a key thing in the game and that's definitely translated into the show that monophobia, I think it's called, it's like a really genuine fear for her, is ending up alone. Um, what she finds cool, I think she finds the idea of the world before cool. Like she's very curious, she's asking, she asks Joel a lot of questions about like, with the plane, I don't know, there's loads of things. Like I think she just finds the idea of this other world fascinating. She's just a normal, like, I mean, she's not a normal teenager. Like, she's, she's really not. Um, it's the only life that she's ever known. It's the only world that she's ever known. So I don't I think it's just, it just is like, I don't think she necessarily longs for the past world because she doesn't know what she's... In the same way that I've never eaten meat, right? So I don't know what I'm missing out on. <laughs> uh, and Ellie's never experienced the world as, as we know it. So mm -hmm. she doesn't really have any, like, enough of a concept of what she's missing out on to sort of long for it. Apocalypse native. Mm. Joel specifically is not your made for Hollywood type hero. He makes choices that not everyone would agree with and the morality can often be very gray with him. Did you have any thought or feeling or worry or concern that maybe a TV show would get a little bit too Hollywoodized for that character? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think I had more of those concerns when um, I was working on the film version of this that ultimately didn't work out because there was just too much story to try to condense it to, to two hours. But when I teamed up with Craig, he just fundamentally understood what was important and not important, uh, that those worries went away really quickly and were replaced with just like a deep trust in this other creator um, to, as he would put it, co-parent um, this thing. I never had to worry about that. I never had to make a list of these are the things that we have to keep or not keep. Mm -hmm. Everything was an open conversation to say, what are things that are already working that we don't need to change? And we don't need to change things just for the sake of changing them. And what are things that are just, they work really well in this interactive medium, but they're not going to work in a, in a passive medium and they have to be replaced by something else. And that's where we like said, okay, well, let's elevate the drama and the relationships and the perspective that we have in this world mm -hmm. to really kind of flesh out Joel and all the surrounding characters. 
I know you love the game. What aspect, what set piece, what like scene or even like frame where you like, it has to be in here or this is not The Last of Us that I want to do? Oh, there's all sorts of things from the game that were like that. Um, that was part of the process was trying to figure out, okay, here's something that we want to show perfect fidelity to because I'm a fan. I mean, I experienced it the way Neil intended to originally and so I knew the moments that I was like, I, we got to do this exactly the same. But actually, mostly we do things sort of the same. And mm -hmm. sometimes we really wander off and do things quite differently. If you play the game, there will be a lot of surprises. But we did it because ultimately we're trying to make a show for people who haven't played the mm -hmm. game. And mm -hmm. Experience it just as itself. So I would say this. If you're a real fan of The Last of Us, you could probably make a list of things that must be in The Last of Us pretty sure we covered them. Can you talk about the scope of season one? Are we covering the full game in season one? Are we going to have any of the downloadable content worked in there? Talk to me about that, please. Yeah, I think if you're a sharp eyed viewer and you've played the game and you've watched the trailer, you can see we're we're going pretty deep. We do pretty much take care of the first game through our narrative. And there's definitely DLC elements with Riley. You know, we're pretty thorough about it and we're going to give you more than the game, but we're also going to give you that story as well and integrate it in a way that makes sense for television. For people who have not played the game and are coming into this a little bit cold, talk to me a little bit about the relationship between Tommy and Joel as we come into the series. Tommy and Joel are all each other has, and they were for a long time until, you know, Joel and uh, Sarah. And we don't learn a lot about what happened to their parents, what happened to Joel's wife. Um, it's touched on here and there in the game. But what we're left with is just this tiny little family unit that is... Um, you know, a two men and a baby kind of scenario. <laughs> they're similar in a lot of ways that they don't want to acknowledge, but they're also, they, they're kind of diametrically different in, the, in that, you know, I think Joel is a little more hardened, obviously, by his experience. And and, and Tommy, you would think, would be with his experience in, in, right. in four times, but he, um, he somehow has kind of crawled out of that with this very fun, playful spirit, you know, take life as it comes, a very Austin, keep it weird kind of attitude. <laughs> it's fun to play that. It's fun to be that for, for Pedro and to be that for, for Nico in those early scenes and yeah. and then give us some place to go once once we uh, once the story unfolds. The setup between Joel and his daughter and the whole bit, it's like it, it's so true and it's so deep and it's so beautiful. That's the heart of it. <laughs> Anyway, cut to <laughs> the world changes and um, <laughs> and you meet Joel, you know, 20 years later. My character Tess and Joel are, are partners. They're, you know, they're partners in work and they're lovers. They live together and I think they're the same to each other. I think that Joel's the only one Tess really trusts and vice versa and mm -hmm. they're just getting by. You know, they're just getting by. People do not get to play their characters from a game in live action. So like, it just doesn't happen very often. So talk to me a little bit about your reaction when you're like, I get to play this character in real life as well as in this very popular game. I have this uh, deep connection with the character and I have a deep connection of the character through Neil. So to hear that news from him was especially sweet and wonderful. And the fact that it was even brought to my table was very exciting. But yeah, not only does that never happen, but to, you know, get 10 years of still being in love with the character and then aging into the character. <laughs> I mean, is this like some kind of Hollywood dream come true? Or I mean, it it, it absolutely is, and I um, have loved every bit of and of every journey that I've gotten to take with her. As Marlene, as the leader of the Fireflies, I feel like you were particularly able to kind of maybe give the uninitiated viewer an overview. What are the Fireflies? Can you give us a little explanation of that for people who might not know? Yeah, the Fireflies are um, a, a a rogue regime that, um, you know, the FEDRA is is kind of a, a military situation that is set up in, in this post-apocalyptic world. And they are the resistance holding that hope, that lantern, that we may be able to go back to the way it was, or there is a new freedom that is available to us in the future. And it is difficult, it is hard, it is dark, and um, leading that kind of charge that may feel futile or hopeless to people who, who cannot see, see any kind of light is a a hard charge for her to carry and and so the the complicated nature of Marlene what she has to contend with what she has lost and then what her choices are not just um you know what she sacrifices for self but for the greater good are uh, deeply compelling for any artist